Greetings, Internet! Welcome to another fantabulous, fun-filled show of the Comic Watcher Show. I'm your host, Matt. With me, as ever, is trusty sidekick slash co-pilot, churlish Chad Burdett, uh, <laughs> coming at us from New York. Chad, I sincerely hope you're not getting snowed in right now up there. Too no, it, it's, it, it, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. That's that's that's, a, that, that, that's the that, um, that's the thing. We we get we get bad snows, and then the next day everything's back to normal. That's cool. That's cool. Where are you? Yeah, I love upstate New uh, Albany. Oh, I went to college in Albany. Very cool. Oh, ah. I, I think uh, I think you one time you spoke um, at one of the uh, uh, University of Albany a couple years ago. Yeah, many, many, many yeah. years. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Well, I. At the time, I was writing the comics blog for the uh, newspaper up here, and I was—I know uh, I knew one of the guys who was part of the program you were doing, and I was like, "Oh, can you get me an interview?" <laughs> <laughs> well, now you, it only took like what eight years or so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, a, I've derailed it. <laughs> Our guest this week. Uh, Man, the myth, the legend of both television and comics, Mr. Mark Guggenheim. Good evening, good afternoon. How are you, sir? I'm good. I'm good. How are you guys? We're very well. Thank you kindly. Excited. You. <laughs> we are excited. Um, thank you for joining our silly little podcast. Uh, we, Mark, you have really recently, um, in recent months, I should say, rededicated yourself to your passion for comics. You've had a lot of uh, very interesting new projects come out. Your newest ones are uh, the original graphic novel Fragmentation from Dark Horse and then Torrent from Image. Before we get into those, I have to ask you a very important question. Okay. And that is... What can we three do right now to get Legends of Tomorrow back somewhere? Um, <laughs> somewhere, anywhere. Well, I think it would involve. I, I got to tell you, that like the Mega Ball Lottery, we'd have to start there. Um, <laughs> okay, a fair amount of money. Um, <laughs> also, running the numbers. Yeah, um, it, it, that's that's certainly what it would take. Um, you know, I mean, gosh, there aren't even sets anymore. You know, the sets have all been taken. <laughs> really? in. Uh, wow, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, it's it's that's depressing it's, too. <laughs> yes, I know. It's it's it, look, it was heartbreaking. I mean, really, really heartbreaking. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. You, well, know, but, you know, and I mean, the whole Arrowverse was at least in part your baby. Um, I was, was part, a parent, uh, I was a co parent with, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Um, so and I mean. It's 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 really it's winding down. Um, Arrow concluded. Um, Superman and Lois is still going, although it's sort of kind of more Arrowverse adjacent. They sort of took themselves out of the Arrowverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how and it, it sort of feels like it's reaching, in some ways, with with the Flash becoming the flagship show after Arrow um, concluded. It feels like it's sort of ending where it should, in in a way, but there were certainly bumps along the way too. Like, could there be an Arrowverse without Arrow? Eh. Could there be one without Green Arrow or Flash? Eh, probably not. Um, yeah. How, how does it feel? Like you said, you know, there's been some depressing turns. We lost Legends of Tomorrow. We lost Batwoman. Um, Black Lightning did its successful four season run and i felt like it was uh one of the most consistent shows in the of the bunch but um what what are your thoughts just you know i'm sure by now that the you you've had some time to process this yes and, and despite all that time i think my thoughts are still pretty complex um you know <laughs> because, because here's the thing like back in 2019 after crisis on infinite earths aired i walked away from the Arrowverse. Um, and I, I walked away sort of feeling like, okay, like I've done my job. Like we've combined all the universes. We've got Earth Prime now. You know, we've got uh, basically our version of the Justice League. Like we're, we're pretty well positioned to do some really cool things going forward. Um, and that I, I kind of feel was like that was, again, if you want to speak in terms of parenting, I, you know, I helped raise the child. I thought that, you know, we sent the child off to college and, you know, my work was kind of done. Um, 
you know, I don't think when I left, I had any particular vision for how I felt the Arrowverse should end in large part because the idea never even like, it's not that it didn't occur to me. It's that I never really gave any thought to it because yes, of course, right. all end, but it never, I never really thought about what that would look like. I guess I always thought in my heart of hearts that the end would be on our or the universe's own terms, you know, that, that it would be a sort of a, a decision to end, or at the very least, a, um, a decision that was made by other people in enough time for the people involved with the Arrowverse, whoever that was, would have time to react to it. You know, Batwoman, they didn't have to, they didn't know they were going to get canceled. Uh, the Legends Tomorrow, we didn't know we were going to get canceled. Um, right. You know, I wasn't in the room for the decision to basically pull Superman and Lois from the, you know, Arrowverse. Um, you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't around, so I can't really speak to those deci the decisions that were made right. after I left because that's just not my right, you know? Um, but I, I think it was the suddenness of everything that probably, you know, was unexpected. Um, and I, I would have, you know, I, I think left to my own devices, I would have liked to have seen an opportunity to, you know, create sort of a soft landing for, for, you know, everything. In fact, it's funny, like a few months ago, I reached out to Jim Lee and I pitched him uh, like just the idea. And I didn't have like a story, but just the notion of like, is there a world where we like use a comic book series to, you know, put a bow around the Arrowverse and, and end things. Um, and, uh, then, you know, I'll be honest, I, I kind of lost interest in the idea because, um, of the whole James Gunn of it all, which I'm sure your <laughs> listeners and your viewers know all about. Um, so that's kind of, you know, that, that's kind of where things stand. And I don't even know, I mean, I'm so out of the loop guys. Like I didn't even know until it was public that Stephen Amell was coming back to reprise his role as Oliver on the flash. Uh, you know, no, no one called me, no one told me. So, um, right, right. Uh, you know, I mean, time, time, time passes, it does happen, but yeah, um, um yeah, I, I, it would get like you, you spoke to the suddenness of it, and from that, to continue to beat our metaphor to death of parenting, uh, <laughs> to suddenly just learn that some of your children are not going to be there anymore is probably pretty jarring, even if you're not in the loop. Well, you know, it's funny, like, oh God, okay, we're going to take this metaphor and take a really dark turn with it. Um, <laughs> we all thought it was, yes, it was like the ch the children, Batwoman and Legends were, were killed. Um, and the funny thing is, it's kind of like, you know, whenever, whenever there's a murder, it's like a whodunit, right? Like, who, who was holding the knife? And the funny thing is, it wasn't even the CW, it was Warner Brothers. Uh, right. You know, Warner Brothers killed it. So it's like, wait a second, like, that's you know, again, our terrible parenting analogy, but like the nanny killed the kids. Yeah. Um, so very surprising. Um, you know, so yeah, it's just, that's just how it, you know, how it happened to play out. So it goes, man. And uh, I mean, I don't think it's an understatement to say that, that the advent of superhero television, as we think of it now, starts with arrow and flash and and the burg then burgeoning arrowverse and so i mean regardless of how it it ended you were definitely there for the beginning of something that has all has really just grown in into its own cottage industry within television today that isn't going anywhere anytime soon so i mean my hat's off to you Obviously, you couldn't have known what was going to happen with all these other shows popping up. But I mean, really, I, it one of the things and I, I don't want to wax nostalgic too much because remember when is a, the lowest form of conversation. Huh. But one of the th uh, that's that's per Tony Soprano. So, yep. um, but, uh, you know, people were like, man, the, the comic book TV shows, they, they suck. They never work out. They never last long. They get canceled. And then here comes these shows uh, that just do wonderful things by embracing comic book roots. I mean, 
who would have thought, right? Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, you know, it, I, I think we sort of saw, you know, the, the magic of these properties, uh, you know, before a lot of other people did. Um, and I think it also helped that we, you know, we, we launched at a time when the technology had finally started to catch up with right. the, the concepts. Uh, I, I definitely doff my cap to the legions of visual effects artists who worked on all the Arrowverse shows because, um, you know, in many ways, I, I don't think you could have done, you know, even Arrow. Uh, I don't think you could have done Arrow the way we did it, uh, you know, three years prior. Um, you know, the technology just wasn't there. And it certainly, I think, was the case for Flash. So, um, yeah. you know, I think uh, we, we sort of caught, you know, we, we caught a variety of different breaks uh, and we found our proper moment, um, you know, and, you know, half of, I believe, half of any uh, success uh, is luck. Um, sure. We had, we had a fair amount of luck. Uh, half there. is being generous. What? <laughs> Yes, it's exactly. being generous, right. I think. It's true. Um, you know, and again, we, we you know, uh, I always sort of, you know, remind myself that, you know, Arrow came about uh, literally on the heels of the Green Lantern movie that right. you know, was, was, you know, whether you like <laughs> or hate it, it, it wasn't a good experience for Greg Berlanti and I. Um, we didn't have fun um, doing, you know, doing that and sort of watching what, what sort of became of it. So, um, you know, it was, uh, we, we kind of, you know, we had raised, a, again, our terrible analogy, we, we raised a problem child and we weren't so sure we wanted to try to have another one. <laughs> well, I, I will always defend um, the the casting choices made in, in Green Lantern. And I'll, I will leave it at that because there were some, them, some damn good ones. Thank you. So, Look, there's there's yeah. elements of that movie that I think work really well. And, I do too. You know, and, and the truth is, even though it wasn't the movie that we set out to make, it, it wasn't, you know, what we originally wrote. Um, it, it, it there are there are elements of it that I do think work. And I also think if you compare it to a lot of superhero movies that have come since, it's certainly no worse than a lot of those superhero movies. Right. Um, yeah. You know. Uh, it, it wasn't as good as we had aspired uh, for it to be, but uh, you know, and then to this day, people still come up to me conventions and everything and say how much they enjoyed the movie. Um, you know, so I, I uh, always appreciate that. That's what's up, dude. That's how you know you've done something right. Yeah. So yeah. no, I, I used to be like very resistant to it. Like if someone would come up to me and, and say like, I love green lantern. I'd always be like, you're the one. Um, but I, you know, I, I now sort of appreciate it more and I appreciate the movie more and I appreciate the response to the movie more. Um, yeah. and I think it's, it's aged surprisingly well. Um, if you can believe that. Very cool, my friend. Well, let's, let's get, let's, uh, we started off off top or started out off topic. So that's totally on me. My, my oh, good. humorous <laughs> question took quite a, quite a 13 minute turn there. Um, You've really dove back into comics lately, and I love that. Um, you. you, yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, you've really doubled down and um, turned out some really interesting creator owned work. Uh, we have had, uh, like, <clears throat> we've got Torrent right now, we've had uh, Two Dead to Die, we've had Headshots. And uh, Fragmentation came out in January, an original graphic novel from Dark Horse. Uh, tell us about it, because I love the premise. I'm not going to lie. Uh, of course. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, you know, well, I'll tell you, it's kind of funny because um, back in 2020, in January of 2020, I made a New Year's resolution. That I was like, I knew I was ending my time with the Arrowverse. I knew that I would have some more time you know on my hands and i made this new year's resolution i want to do more creator own comics and then um a global pandemic happened and suddenly <laughs> that time i had on my hands like doubled and tripled so yeah. um i suddenly had more time than ever to do comic books so it's actually the only new year's resolution i've ever kept um <laughs> and it's kind of just a, a weird bit of coincidence that 
all, almost all the projects I started during the pandemic have been released um, in the last four months. That, that I would say that there was a plan. There was a grand plan. There was no plan. It was, just, it was I was just <laughs> you're doing comic books. We're going um, to verse. Yeah, no, <laughs> like a total, total accident that it all happened to hit the market, you know, kind of, you know all at once. Um, but uh, Tor was was definitely one of those first initial pandemic books. Um, Justin Greenwood and I, who uh, I'd work with Justin on two projects for Oni Press, Resurrection and Stringers. Uh, he and I were talking during the pandemic. We you know we re remained in touch. And he was commenting sort of how, you know, by the way, you know, I happen to like have like a window coming up. Um, I, you know, can do something with you if you're game. I'm like, I'm absolutely game. And <coughs> excuse me, I thought about what I want to do with Justin. And um, I, there was an idea that I sort of had burning a hole in my notebook um, about sort of taking a Spider-Man character and turning that character into the Punisher, you know, take a, a light lighthearted, quippy, uh, fun-loving, easygoing character and turning them into a killing machine, I thought was an interesting character arc. Um, yeah. I, I pitched that to, uh, you know, I pitched that to Justin. He was totally into it. Um, and we just, we hit the ground running. Um, and, uh, you know, issue one is out. Issue two is coming out very shortly. I should know the date, but of course I don't because I know nothing. Um, but it's it's a blast. And I, I have to say it's gotten like some of the best reviews of any comic book I've ever worked on, uh, which is really saying something. Um, yeah, you know, for sure. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited. It seems to have resonated with a lot of people. Um, I think there's more of an appetite out there for original superheroes that aren't tied to the DC and Marvel universes than I think yeah. a lot of people, you know, give the market credit for. Well, I mean, look at what Kyle Higgins is doing with Radiant Black and that yeah. whole ever expanding little corner of, of superhero fandom yeah well kyle's a good friend so um in fact <laughs> um kyle uh you know uh, kyle was uh intimately involved with one of the other books i did uh last flight out um he, he's you know he's actually the one who sort of put together the whole team you know the, yeah. the artists and everything um you know, Edward hooked me up with Edward Eduardo Ferragato, uh, our incredibly talented artist on that book. Um, yeah, Kyle's the best. Um, you know, and he's, I love what he's built out with Radiant Black and the Massive Verse. It's very, very, very cool. I can, I can only aspire to that level of success. <laughs> my, <Right>? my, <laughs> my goals are, are much more prosaic. I just want to do like one book and have it sell reasonably well for me to be able to continue to do it, you know? <laughs> Makes sense to me. Uh, Chad, I, I've been sucking up all the oxygen on our side of things, dude. Jump no, in. That, no, that's okay. I mean, I was going to ask, uh, in the for, like the foreword to your uh, Too Dead to Die, you say that you're writing that now for 10-year-old Mark. Is, yes. was, that your, was that your first exposure to comic books? You know, what was the first comic book you remember reading? I mean, Ooh, good question. <laughs> I, I'll be honest with you. I was so young that I actually don't remember how old I was. It was like one of my first memories uh, was being on the floor of my bedroom at home and just flipping through the pages of a Superman comic. And my mother came in and she thought, you know, I couldn't even read at that point. So like, you know, she thought she had a savant on her hands and I'm like, no, I'm just reading. I'm just looking through the page, you know, looking at the pictures. I don't even remember where I got the comic book from, um, you know, so it's, it's really comic books have, have been in my blood, you know, since, you know, at, since I was cognizant, I had, you know, blood, um, uh, you know, I, I grew up, you know, mainly with like DC comics up until the time I was like, you know, I would say seven years old, six or seven years old. And then um, I discovered, I actually discovered Marvel comics through these, there was a publisher of paperbacks called Pocket Books, and Pocket Ooh. Books published these paperback-sized editions that I still have. I still have my copies of them. Um, <laughs> uh, of you know the original, you know Steve Ditko, Stan Lee, Spider-Man, Jack Kirby, Stan Lee, Fantastic Four, Incredible Hulk, Doctor Strange. I just devoured those things, um, and that was my you know gateway drug into Marvel. <laughs> And so it went. And so, you tend yeah, to it think it's funny. It's it seems to have worked out. 
<laughs> I can assume I know the answer to this just based on your resume, but I, do you consider yourself more of a Marvel guy or more of a DC guy? You know, I, I honestly, I mean, I do like both. I, I will sure. say as a writer, I'm more of a Marvel guy. I, um, I've, I've written DC stuff, but if you look at Arrow, honestly, even, even legends, if, if you look at the, the DC live action stuff I've done, they tend to feel, I feel like more like Marvel properties than I would say you know, for the, sure. With um, legends, I can see, you know, that. um, you know, so I, I kind of, you know, and, and it's funny, like I, I did a run on justice society of America and sort of, Every time I take on a book, um, whether it's creator owned or, or for hire, I always sort of like give myself either a challenge or I, I commit to a certain approach, something that is going to make my run on that book, whether it's an ongoing or limited, unique, like, you know, for myself, you know, like, like right. I, I don't approach, you know, X-Men the same way I approach Batman, the same way I approach Blade, like, or Wolverine, like. I'll pick something. And with Justice Society, I what I picked was I want to write this as if this was a Marvel book. I want to write this as if these were Marvel characters. And you know what I discovered? Um, that doesn't necessarily work. It's a little bit like saying you're going to play a violin the same way you would play a piano. Um, they're yeah. just different instruments. The two universes are different instruments. And I don't think one is better than the other um but i do consider myself like you know i guess to continue the musician analogy i consider myself more of a piano player than a violinist even though i feel like i can play both instruments but i'm more at ease at the at a, at a keyboard okay fair enough yeah. chat oh i was just uh, going to kind of move on to fragmentation kind of where did the idea for that story, you know, the premise, I guess the premise come from. Oh yeah. Uh, because um, it's, 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 it's a very interesting premise. And yeah. Yeah. For those, for those who maybe haven't read uh, fragmentation, do you want to give the, the, the quickie synopsis of it, Mark? I'm going to do, I'm, I, you know what? We're short on time guys. I'm going to answer both questions with the same answer. How does that sound? Um, okay. So you know those things you see on like Instagram or something where someone will take an old photograph and hold it up um, and take a picture. And like, you sort of see like the black and white photograph shows you what the building or the location looked like decades ago and mm -hmm. everything else around is modern. You guys sort of seen that. I know it's, a yeah, yeah, visual. Definitely. but I got, I, I got to, you know, seeing a bunch of those. Uh, my brother, David actually likes to take those kinds of photos all the time. And he's really good at it. And I would look at them and I'd go, what if, what if you could actually like see into the past this way? What if, what if there were these windows that literally allowed you to like look into moments of historical significance? And that's really the start of fragmentation. It's, it's, you know, this phenomenon that starts to open throughout the entire world. And it's about the ex-husband and wife, uh, these two former spouses who have to try to figure out what is going on and, you know, potentially how to stop it because it's turning, you know, it's, it's causing worldwide panic, as you might imagine. Um, sure. So that's, that's, you know, the, that's the simple conceit of it. The, the more, I think, sort of uh, subversive element of the book is that it at, at its heart is really a family drama. Um, yeah. So I kind of describe it as like a Christopher Nolan film. If Christopher Nolan were to write and direct a family drama, um, <laughs> that's my inspiration. Um, so that's been a lot of fun, and that you know that I published uh, with Dark Horse, um, uh, and that came out uh, like just a month ago. Mm -hmm. But it's an awesome, awesome uh, read. Uh, Benny nice. Benny Lobel's art just gorgeous. Uh, Fantastic! How did you, yeah, yeah, most definitely. Um, it's it's very down to earth, but um, yeah, strongly wondered um, if that makes sense. You know, yeah, you, you were going to ask how I got him. Um, that was is that. Yeah, actually, Megan Walker, the editor on the book, uh, sent me uh, samples from a whole bunch of different artists. I I started off the only guidance I'd given her was I, I feel like. 
because of the nature of the book, I wanted an artist with very clean lines, you know, someone who, yeah. you know, is going to be able to render these visual concepts in a way that's clear enough for the reader to actually understand what they're looking at. Um, you know, so uh, Benny's uh, are just, you know, jumped right out at me and he, he's absolutely fantastic. Uh, in fact, I'm talking with him about doing a different project together because um, working with him was such a pleasure and he's such a pro and he's got this really great, you know, like very Mike McCone-esque style that I love. And uh, and then I, you know, I asked Dark Horse uh, if they would hire Chris Sotomayor um, for the colors. Um, because Chris and I have worked on a, a bunch of different projects together. Sure. And I think he's he's one of Chris the best. Chris on everybody's project. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's terrific. He's, I mean, yeah. the, uh, you know, he's, he's a colorist, a colorist, colorist, um, if that's, Indeed. if that's possible. <laughs> Indeed it is. I, I, now why do fragmentation as a graphic novel rather than a mini series or possibly even an ongoing series? Because I, I feel like that has, it has the potential to go on and have all kinds of interesting adventures in its world. Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question, actually. Yeah. And the, the answer really comes from sort of how the project sort of came to life in the first place. Um, basically, what happened was I was just doing a Zoom with the folks at Dark Horse um, and they they had uh, just asked me like what I was up to. And I showed them I had the first issue of Last Flight Out finished and it just happened to be like printed on my desk because I was going to do some notes on the lettering. And I didn't have a publisher for that yet. Um, you know, but I sort of showed that to them and told them what it was about. And they were like, oh, my God, we want to do that. Um, you know, and do you have what other sort of ideas do you have? They, they like the the combination of genre with a, a family story. Um, They're like, oh, we, we really, you know, we love, you know, combining science fiction with, with family drama. And I'm like, oh, well, in that case, you might like this thing I call fragmentation. And I pitched them that and they were like, oh, well, we'd love to do that with you, too. Um, we'd love to do that as a graphic novel. So I'm like, OK, they want to do it as a graphic novel. That's <laughs> that's how I'll get a story at. That's easy enough to do. Makes sense to me. Um, <laughs> they said it. We did it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Most of it, 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 if, if they ask, do you definitely have you know more stories in that universe that you should tell? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I, I do. I think it, it's, it's a little like when we were working on Arrow, like we would finish the end of, you know, we'd start, we'd reach the end of the season. And even before the season was over, we'd start to already think about like what the next season could be. And um, I find that that's been the case with my, you know, comic book properties too, and my comic book work, where as I reach the end of, either an arc or reach the end of, you know, a particular, you know, miniseries or graphic novel, my brain starts to generate like what the continuation of the story is because, you know, life, unless, unless all the characters die at the end of the story, it, you know, it, th these characters have their own sort of, you know, virtual inner lives and those lives continue on even after you reach the last page. So I, my brain just naturally starts to ask the question, Okay, well, what what would happen next in their lives? Um, so yes, there's there's absolutely you know future stories to be told with fragmentation. Um, I mean, you know. really, it lends itself to an anthology if you wanted to look at it that way. Um, oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, with, with fragmentation, I'd I like if I were to revisit fragmentation, what I would also want to do is I, I am a you know I grew up on like movies like Empire Strikes Back sequels that don't just retell the original story, but really, really open up the world. Um, and, you know, I, I sort of have this idea for fragmentation of not just continuing with the story of, of these three people, this family, but really also telling some stories um, from within the fragmentations um, and the nature of, you know, the people inside of them, uh, you know, from these other time periods. Um, so, you know, if I if I get to do fragmentation two or whatever I would end up calling it, uh, it would be a, a, a bigger undertaking um, by you know by its nature. You love to hear it. Uh, <laughs> so so you you've said you you know you're 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 hitting the ground running with comics. Um, I presume you have some more stuff in the works from various publishers. 
uh, part creative own, perhaps otherwise, uh, anything on the boil that you can talk about? Ooh, good question. Well, um, aren't you involved in the, uh, Star Wars, uh, Marvel Star Wars? Marvel Star Wars is keeping me beautifully busy. Uh, I have such a great time doing it. Um, I've got uh, next, I think it's next week, um, the one shot I did called Jabba's Palace um, that is tied to the 40th anniversary of Return of the Jedi. Uh, that comes out. That's a blast. It, it was so much fun to do. Um, it basically, it's, you know the, the, the droid that's being torn apart uh, when R2 and uh, C-3PO were brought in to the sort of the droid torture chamber? Um, it tells the story of how that droid ended up in that situation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so that that's been a blast. Uh, that's actually with an artist named uh, I'll butcher his last name, unfortunately, uh, Alessandro Moroccolo. Um, and Alessandro is drawing my arc on the Yoda book that's been ongoing um, mm -hmm. that Evan Scott launched. And now Jody Hauser's picked up, and then Jody will hand the baton to me, and I'll write um the 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 final three issues before cabin's final final issue um so i'm doing that uh and then then there's something else happening in star wars that hasn't been announced yet that i'm doing something related to uh but i can't talk about it because <laughs> you know we've all been teasing it um lately uh but so I'm doing that. I'm doing a four-issue miniseries for Marvel proper, not in the Star Wars universe, but in the Marvel universe. Again, that hasn't been announced. Uh, there's another creator-owned book um, that uh, I'm working on right now that I say I'm working on because I, you know, but my work has been done for a while. I'm waiting for, you know, some uh, some final pieces of art to come in for, you know, coloring and lettering to come in. Um, so that's, um, that's in the works and then, you know, and then there's, you know, there's torrent, which is continuing to come out through image. Uh, the second issue comes out in a couple of weeks. Um, and, uh, that's, you know, that's a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, plenty of, plenty of comic book stuff that's, that's keeping me busy. One thing I had missed is torrent an ongoing or a mini series. It's an ongoing. It's an okay. ongoing. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. I, I like that. Because a lot of times, and I hate to sound like an old man yelling at clouds, but a lot of times books that are miniseries don't necessarily get marketed as such uh, well, anymore. And it, yeah. it throws me as the old man in the room <laughs> off the game no, a little bit too. because I'll, I'll buy the first few. It's like, oh, shit, I could have just bought the trade. You know, well, that's right. Um, and, and honestly, I think that's uh, that's the, unfor the unfortunate thing is the reason – the reason they're marketed that way is because a lot of people would just trade weight on it. And, you know, but also it's funny, it becomes, it can become a little bit of a um, self-fulfilling prophecy because a lot of times people will buy the first issue of something. And if they like it, they'll stop buying the monthly and they'll wait for the very first trade. True. And, if that suppresses sales enough, the what was supposed to be an ongoing becomes a miniseries, right? <laughs> because it gets oh, the vagaries of the industry. It's tough, yeah, it's tough, especially these days, you know. But that's just the way it goes, right? So you're you're you've got a pretty good mix of of your own uh, creator owned properties and and uh, Marvel stuff, and then Star Wars Marvel. Um, what what is it like? Like what what are the different creative muscles that you have to flex, juggling between those two things? You know, um, it it depends. Um, you know, it, it, like with Star Wars, or like with the Star Wars books, I you know, and I'm not unique in this respect. I, I think there's a lot of Star Wars writers over the years who have, who also take this approach. But with Star Wars, I try to write it as if it was a live action movie or TV show, which means. There's no internal narration. There's no omniscient narration. Um, you know, there's, I, I don't like translate for Chewbacca and R2-D2 because you don't get, there's no subtitles for their dialogue in the movies. Um, you know, I try to apply the same rules that the live action movies and TV shows operate with. So that's, you know, its own interesting challenge, um, which I, I really dig. I, I kind of like that. I like, I like, you know, doing whatever I can to provide a live action experience through yeah. the medium of comics. Um, you know, with, uh, 
the mini series that I'm doing that I can't talk about uh, for Mar you know, for Marvel that's not Star Wars. That's an interesting project because the nature of the story requires me to basically cover 30 years um, of of story in four issues. So um, that's its own interesting little challenge. Um, and I'm, I'm having a blast with it because it has a huge cast of characters. And I'm, I've never written like a big crossover in comic books before, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is something I really love to do for, for real. But this is like the closest I've come in the sense of like it's a lot of story and a lot of characters to service. And I'm sort of having to learn new tricks uh, and now I'm starting to realize, oh, that's why that worked in that cross <laughs> point life because this is this is how you do it, um, you know. So that those are some different creative muscles, and then obviously with you know the creator on stuff, it it really is project dependent. You know, um, sure. you know each each project really sort of has its own you know unique challenges. And like I said earlier, whenever I take on a comic book project, no matter what it is, I sort of self impose certain restrictions on myself. Um, you know, or, or set certain goals for myself in terms of how I want to tell the story. Um, because I think that that's, you know, that's what keeps it fun. Oh, and I forgot, you know, by the way, um, I'm doing a five issue Star Trek uh, mini series for IDW. Um, you know, they've got some uh, interesting Star Trek stuff happening right now. I, I they know. do. They do. All credit uh, to Heather Antos. Um, she's, yeah, well. you know, spearheading all that. She's fantastic. <laughs> mm -hmm. She did, you know, a very, the very, uh, you know, she was very in involved when Marvel launched, you know, the Disney owned era of mm -hmm. Star Wars comics. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it, you know, she's, she's great. And um, I love the ambition that she's bringing to the entire line. It's really exciting. That's awesome. Uh, so we, yeah, we're, we're starting to run down on time. Um, Chad. Well, I, I, well, one, I was I, one more good one. All right. Well, I was. Uh, we've talked about uh, everyone except for we really haven't talked about Too Dead to Die with uh, which he did with an up and coming artist, uh, Howard Chagan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's gonna go places. <laughs> he's, he's got. I think he's got a future ahead of him. Um, yeah, I love Howard. I mean, I love Howard as a person. I love collaborating with him. And this is say like the fourth thing we've done together. And uh, he, he's the way that came about also was just so satisfying to me because Two Dead to Die again was one of these early pandemic books that I was writing that I, I, I just started writing it, you know, because I had time. Um, I didn't have an artist. I didn't have a publisher. I didn't have anything but the idea. And um, when I write, I'm sort of envisioning the art in my mind's eye. Um, so that's how I know what to describe in the script. And it was about you know, 10 to 20 pages in when I realized that the images I was seeing in my mind's eye were all drawn by Howard. Um, so, I, you know, I sort of finished up the, what was what became the first chapter and I emailed Howard and I said, is, you know, is there any interest on your part uh, to, ch to checking this out? Um, because I basically wrote it for you without realizing I was writing it for you. And, right. oh, send it over. and I, what I didn't know until Howard and I did an interview uh, like a month ago uh, together, I didn't realize that he had sworn off uh, drawing other people's scripts um, that he only was going to, you know, draw his own, his own stuff. Um, so I, I was very flattered that he said yes in the first place, but now I'm supremely yeah. flattered uh, <laughs> him to break a vow. Um, and it, it was a great experience. We, we really had a lot of fun with it. Um, and uh, I, I'm at hard at work on the screenplay. Um, oh, great. So, uh, <laughs> doing that for, for Universal Studios and 87 North, uh, who did Bullet Train, um, and among other great movies, Violent Night. Um, so... <laughs> That's uh, you know, that that's been a, a real a real joy and uh, a fun you know, fun little project. And could you kind of give us a quick synopsis of you know the premise of this the story? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, there's a a character who's sort of the American version of James Bond. Uh, he's you know now in his seventies. He's long since retired. The world has changed you know around him, uh, and he finds out that of the many many assignations he had uh, back in the day, it turns out there was a daughter he never knew he had, and uh, when he finds out that she's in danger, he comes out of retirement for one last adventure. 
That's really cool. What, what if James Bond made it to his golden years? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I, it's, I, it's, I, I love the concept. Like, there's, <laughs> it's, one of those, it, it's one of those concepts where I kept waiting for someone to do it because to me, right? it seems so obvious and no one was doing it. And so again, like pandemic hit production shuts down. I've got all this time in my hands. I'm like, well, damn it. I'm going to tell myself the story because I'm kind of curious. <laughs> um, so uh, it's yeah, it's it's really a lot of fun. Um, you know, we got for the you know, we, we published it as a graphic novel. Uh, I wrote a prose short story for it um, mm. that uh, where basically Simon Cross, the protagonist, meets his British equivalent, shall we say. <laughs> um, and and that was a lot of fun. Uh, and I, I wanted to do a couple of short stories of Simon in his salad days back, you know, back in the eighties and nineties when he was yeah. at his powers. So uh, we were very fortunate to get Michael Golden and uh, Jose Garcia Lopez two incredible Titans from the eighties and nineties to draw uh, Simon in the, in the eighties and nineties. So um, that that's really, really special. So um, it's just, yeah, it's a, it's a really fun book. I think, you know, the, the package that we put together, you know, there's, there's covers from the 1980s. There's, you know, beautiful spot illustrations that Howard did. There's the short stories, um, you know, then there's the actual main story, uh, you know, which is about six issues worth of, you know, worth of material. So it's, it's pretty good. I, I like to say it's a, it's a good value for your 1995. So uh, this is the one that's, that's being developed by Netflix. Am I correct? Uh, Universal. Universal. Story. Universal. Okay. Um, now, who, 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 you don't have to say anything if it has, there's already been something, but who do you, who would you, what actor would you see in the lead role? You or know, would you like to see? <laughs> we already have him, and I can't tell you who it is. Okay. <laughs> but when I tell you it's perfect casting, I am, I am not speaking with hyperbole. It is okay. perfect casting. <laughs> really, really. <laughs> nice. um, yes, I, I look forward to the day where we can announce that. That's awesome. I can't wait either. <laughs> so, uh, Mark, we got time for one last question. Um, and, and I guess it's kind of a broad, broader one, open to interpretation, if you like. Uh, but you've been doing this for a while. You worked across a, a lot of different media. Um, are, are, are you feeling the tug of retirement or what keeps you going, man? Um, what do you fear that you're going to run out of ideas at some point? I definitely don't fear I'm going to run out of ideas. Um, I, I've got a whole bunch that I still want to get to. Um, you know, I, I've definitely like, look, I'm, you know, I'm 52, you know, at working in industries that where not a lot of 52 year olds uh, still get to do what I do. Um, you know, so I'm definitely cognizant. I'm not feeling the pull of retirement so much as I am feeling the you know the the realities of you yeah. know my age um so i you know i've been thinking a lot about um you know i've been thinking sort of a lot about what the next chapter looks like and uh you know i think you know if all goes as planned the next chapter will be literal it'll it'll be you know doing more prose writing and publishing uh another you know novel hopefully many more <laughs> uh, but uh yeah, I'm still out there. I'm still, you know, still throwing punches. And, uh, you know, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm lucky in the sense that I, I'm still able, I, I work primarily in three different mediums, television, comics, and film. And I'm very lucky that I'm still able, like, I, there's interest, <laughs> um, you know, phone still <laughs> rings, uh, and there's still interest uh, in the stuff I'm writing. Um, and when the phone stops ringing, then I'll, that's when I think I'll consider a retirement or a career transition. <laughs> now, is there one character, comic book character that, you know, you haven't worked on that, you know, you, you definitely would like a chance to kind of tackle or think you have your own unique take on? I, it's funny. Well, I'll tell you this. I've written Superman and Batman, but I've never done an ongoing run with Superman and Batman. Would love to do an ongoing with them. Um, and I've like, you know, written sort of what I would call cameos for the Fantastic Four in various books that I've worked on. Um, but I've never done a proper Fantastic Four book, but probably the biggest white whale of them all 
uh, is uh, a run on Daredevil. Um, I've done two oh. one shots at Daredevil, <laughs> um, you know, but I'm a former lawyer and, uh, you know, I've, I've written legal dramas and legal thrillers before and I've written superheroes and the opportunity to actually combine those two uh, mm -hmm. and Daredevil's obviously the character to do it with uh, would be really, really cool. I love it. Um, yeah. I think Daredevil is a lot of people's white whale. And personally, I'd love to see you on a <laughs> one with, uh, with Felicity's husband over at DC, but um, <laughs> yeah. well, we just have, oh well, how cool would we just it have be? to get Mark Wade off of world's finest and you can have that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm your friend, and uh, when Mark was uh, writing Daredevil, I, I would sort of joke to him, like, you know, you're lucky I like you so much. Otherwise, I would like try to get you killed. Um, yeah, you know, free up that book. Uh, but uh, you know, yeah, one, you know, I, I'm I'm a big fan of you know of a lot of different characters, and you know, I've done a bunch of ongoing runs, um, but there's still a whole bunch of characters who I haven't done an ongoing with that I would love to love to play with that's awesome well that is all the time we've got with respect for uh mr mark guggenheim's where, busy busy calendar uh where can we <laughs> find you on social media ah, yes question. okay well you can find me it's incredibly complicated because there's i wish there was one thing um but uh i can be found on twitter at m guggenheim uh i'm also on instagram at you know, at symbol, uh, Mark with a C, Guggenheim, M-A-R-C, Guggenheim. Uh, and I also, um, as has just become very public, uh, I also do a weekly Substack newsletter uh, called Legal Dispatch, and you can find that at markguggenheim.substack.com. Awesome. Awesome. Mustn't forget about Substack. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, thank you to our thank you to our guest, Mr. Mark Guggenheim, for stopping by. Yes, thank, thank you, you. Chad, <laughs> for uh, hanging out with me. Thank you to all of you for listening. Uh, I'm I'm Matt. I'm your host. We will be back in two weeks, and uh, until then, you know the world can be a crappy place, but it doesn't have to be. Just take a little time. Be good to somebody out there. Um, read something awesome. Support your local comic book store. And until then, uh, we'll see you in the funny pages. Thank you very much.